Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress. I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We're going to continue now with our reading and discussion of the book, The Foundations Under Attack, The Roots of Apostasy by Michael Dissemlian. Last Friday, we concluded at the top of page 105, we're beginning our discussion about Arminianism. Not Armenianism, Arminianism. And it is named, it's a heresy, uh, uh, a heresy named after its supposed founder, James Arminius. He was also known as Jacob Arminius. And what we find in our discussion, in our reading and discussion of this book, is that Arminius just simply revived an old heresy that preceded him long ago, by the name of Pelagianism. It was Pelagius who was the, the originator of this heresy. And during the time of the Protestant Reformation, when b- people began to read and understand the scriptures by the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit and the privilege for the first time after the Dark Ages of being able to read the scriptures for themselves in their own languages, they began to discover in the Bible that God is sovereign in salvation. It's God who chooses. It's God who saves. And if we are saved, we are saved by the grace of Almighty God and not by any works or any qualities in and of ourselves. We are not participants in our own salvation. I know that's hard for people to understand, especially when we are <clears throat> prone to this vain human uh, pride, which we acquired at the fall. It's, it's hard for us to believe that we cannot save ourselves or that we cannot participate in our own salvation. Man simply is fallen, totally fallen, totally depraved, spiritually dead as a result of the fall in the Garden of Eden. And it's God alone who rescues us and, and, re- and, and restores us to our original uh, status with him uh, prior to the fall. We fell. It's God who restores. It's God who chooses. It's Jesus who bought our salvation. We had nothing to do with it. Could you assist Jesus in what he did on the cross? Even his own disciples tried to prevent him from going to the cross. So which one of us are better than any of his disciples? None of us. And the disciples failed in understanding that they were simply incapable of restoring mankind, saving themselves or anyone else. It was a rescue mission of God alone. Look, it was man who fell. It was as a result of the temptation of the tempter in the Garden of Eden. It was God's creation who rebelled and came under Satan's dominion. And so it's up to God now to save us, and he did it through his son. What part of that is man uh, a contributor? He isn't. He is the one who is lost and undone, just like a lost sheep. Now, if a sheep is lost, can he find his way back to his master? Or does the master have to leave his sheepfold and go look for the one that is lost? And can the sheep, once found, can the sheep claim any credit? Or can the sheep participate in his own rescue? No. But Pelagius and Arminius suggested otherwise that man has a free will to choose God. And it's contrary to the written word of God, the King James Bible. Again, it's difficult for sinful fallen man who, because of pride, fell. It's It's simply impossible for us, vainly prideful people, to comprehend or to admit that we cannot participate in our own salvation. 
A man-centered gospel puts man in charge. It's man who chooses God. It's man who seeks after God. It's man who wins his salvation by some act or some character or some qualification within himself. But the Bible talks about the total depravity of man, the desperate situation that man is in, and that only God can save us. And he did it through his son, who lived a sinless life. He's, he's called the second Adam. He undid the curse of the garden, and he bore upon his body our sins and our failings. And God rendered judgment not upon us, but upon him, on the cross. He bore our punishment. Now God's law is satisfied. And we can be restored. Jesus made a way for us to escape the curse of the Garden of Eden and to be restored to full and complete fellowship with our Creator. What part does man play in that? Simply none. But because of prideful James or Jacob Arminius, and because of, of Pelagius, who tried to float this heresy centuries before, it has reared its ugly head again in the, during the time of the Protestant Reformation, when it was becoming widely understood among God's Spirit-led people, led by the Spirit of God through the reading of the King James Bible, the, the, or the Bible, rather, in the languages of the people, so that they could read God's Word for the first time for themselves, it was revealed that it is God who chooses, it is God who calls, it is God who saves, and all man can do is just express his humility and his gratitude. It's a gift. What part... Do, do you have in when someone offers you a an absolutely free gift you didn't earn it you didn't qualify for it there was nothing that you had a part of it you just simply were granted it that's a gift a free gift <coughs> now if we claim that somehow or other we qualified to be chosen by God, which is what is suggested by Arminianism and Pelagianism, then we become a partner in this salvation. And then we have something about which to boast then, don't we? when the scripture plainly says it's a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast any man so you can see from the clear teaching of scripture and we've only just touched the scriptures that deal with this subject that Arminianism and Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism and every other permutation of this heresy is what it is heresy we can thank God that he loved us so much that he gave his only begotten son that through him and his merit we, the desperately lost, might be saved. See the humility in that? See the thankfulness of that? And I say once again, if man, desperately wicked, completely fallen, totally depraved, totally deceived, and infinitely prideful, is given any portion of our salvation, he would mess it up. <clears throat> so we have to trust Jesus just like we trust the pilot of that multi-engine, heavy-bodied jet airplane every time we board it. There's nothing we can do except sit down, shut up, strap in, and hold on. Jesus is going to get us there. We have to trust Him. We have to accept that we have no part in the cockpit. 
Only he knows where we're going. Only he can get us there safely. And if we interfere, we jeopardize that transport. Okay? Going to show that Arminianism, Pelagianism, is the same thing. It's prideful man trying to interject himself in what God has chosen as the means and the method to save us. And I don't trust any man, including myself, to participate in that effort. Okay? All I'm left with is humility and gratitude. Humility and gratitude. Having been rescued out of a hopeless situation by the only one who could save us. All right. That's enough for that. So we're going to now get into it. Top of page 105. The founder of Arminianism, its articles, and the Synod of Dort. Okay? The author begins by saying, James Arminius, he was also known as Jacob. James Arminius, 1560 to 1609, during the time of the Protestant Reformation, is generally regarded as the founder of the system of Arminianism. He was educated at the New Dutch University at Leiden and then at Geneva under the tutelage of Theodore Beza, Calvin's well-respected follower and successor. After 1591, after only a year at Geneva Academy, he began to develop views that were to become diametrically opposed to the doctrines of free and sovereign grace that were taught at Geneva. He departed and continued his, el his education elsewhere. Now, the author doesn't disclose where that was, but he got a sick education, you can bet. <clears throat> now, it says he became a minister in Amsterdam and was later invited to become professor of divinity at the University at Leiden. It was from this point that he began propounding his theories with guarded rigor. Okay, guarded rigor. Why was it so guarded? Because it differed from the teachings of the Protestant Reformation who taught irresistible grace, free grace. Okay, it's God who chooses and God alone is responsible for our salvation. Okay, salvation is of the Lord. Well, Arminius was going to teach that salvation is a cooperation between man and God. So he would have found himself, if he were not careful, he would have found himself at odds with the Protestant Reformation, and he would have jeopardized himself. <clears throat> All right, continuing. He says, as the doctrines of free grace were in the ascendancy at the time, this is during the Protestant Reformation, his teachings, that is, Arminius' teachings on free will, were bound to arouse controversy and bring him into conflict with the ecclesiastical authorities. This was a dangerous activity, as heresy could be a capital offense. Now, this is where we see the old Roman ways had not completely been purged from the Protestant lump. We still see heresy being subject to capital punishment. Okay? The Roman system was still alive and well. Now it says, perhaps because of this, Arminius was difficult to pin down. His teachings could be very ambiguous and sophistical. In 1605, for example, the Synod set nine simple questions for Arminius to answer in an attempt to clarify his position. He responded with nine opposite questions, and employed scholarly and philosophical devices to avoid giving simple, straight answers. The first question was, quote, which is first, election, that is divine election, God chooses, or faith truly foreseen, so that God elected his people according to faith foreseen? In other words, was it God's sovereign election that saves? 
or is it God's foreknowledge of those who would have faith that he elected them? See how they were trying to pin Arminius down and make him make a distinction? Okay. <clears throat> it says Arminius did not, perhaps dared not, give a straight answer. And so the controversy rumbled on even after his death in 1609. Eventually, his followers, known as the Remonstrants, petitioned the government of Holland with a five-point remonstrance, which was a development of the core teachings of Arminius. It was systematized and published in January of 1610 by Jan Oitenborgen and Simon Episcopius, both former students of Arminius. They led 43 fellow ministers in introducing their document, quote, the Arminian Articles of Remonstrance to the, uh, unquote, to the ecclesiastical authority. So this was publicly presented uh, for consideration. Now, their objective was to bring about the convening of a synod, which would overthrow the doctrine of grace, which had been freely preached since the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, and make the teachings of Arminius the official doctrine of the Reformed churches in all of Europe. So there was a lot at stake. Is God sovereign? Or does he cooperate with man in saving man? That was the issue brought to bear by Arminius through this proposed synod. And it was to the result of that synod was to bind the consciences of everyone in Europe uh, of the Protestant Reformation. All right, it says they were successful in the first part of their endeavor. A general synod at Dort Dortrich, or Dort as it's more commonly known, was called in 1618, and representatives attended it from all the Reformed churches in Europe, including those from England. The following is a summary of the five remonstrance articles. Okay, here, are, here, here is the case that the Arminians brought to the Synod. Point number one. Free will or human ability is what it's called. And it says Arminius believed that the fall of man was not total, maintaining that there is still enough virtue in man to enable him to choose to accept Jesus Christ unto salvation. Okay? There we have the clear expression. It's man who chooses Christ and not God who elects the beloved. All right? Point number two, conditional election is what it's called. And it says, Arminius taught that election is based on the foreknowledge of God as to who would believe. In other words, God foresaw the, the ending from the beginning, and he foreknew who would ex accept his son, and then he elected them. That's contrary to the teaching of Scripture. But now it's out in the open. The cat's out of the bag. It says, man's, quote, act of faith, unquote, is the, quote, condition, unquote, governing his being elected to eternal life. Since God foresaw him exercising his, quote, unquote, free will in response to Jesus Christ. So salvation is an act of the free will of man, right? Pretty clearly stated, isn't it? God foresees that man would use his free will to accept his son. Then God elects them to salvation. See how the, the pride of man is entering in, that man is becoming an instrument of his own salvation, a participant in his own salvation. Now point three is called universal atonement. Arminius held that Christ died to save all men, 
but only in a potential fashion. Christ's death enabled God to pardon sinners, but only on condition that they believe. Okay? Now, so far, some of this is starting to look real familiar. You've been taught this all your life. And you believe it. But it runs counter to what the Bible actually says. <clears throat> Here's another point. Resistible grace is what it's called. And Arminius believed that since God wants all men to be saved, he sends the Holy Spirit to draw all men to Christ. But since man has absolute free will, he is able to resist God's will for his life. Therefore, God's will to save all men can be frustrated by the finite will of man. God's sovereign will can be frustrated by the finite will of man. Arminius also taught that man exercises his own will first and then is born again. You see how man becomes the pilot of the plane in Arminianism and in free willism, in Pelagianism. Now the last point is is called falling from grace. This is a, a an Arminian teaching. It says if man cannot be saved by God unless it is man's will to be saved then man cannot continue in salvation unless he continues to will to be saved. So you not only have to participate in your own salvation, but you have to continue to participate in your salvation. And at any time, if you, by your own free will decide to go back to a Christless life, you can do it. You can choose one day to be saved and the next day not to be saved. That was the life of my father until just before he died he finally came to understand the election of God. He had lived in frustration and doubt all of his life, never finally convincing himself of his ability to save himself, <clears throat> never quite living a holy enough life, repeatedly falling into sin during times of his life. One day, speaking to my dad, he was saved, and going to heaven and thanking the Lord for his grace and the next day he had no assurance whatsoever of his salvation and I came from the same school that he did and just like my dad just before he died there was a day in my life when I realized I had nothing whatsoever to do with my salvation it was God who called, God who chose, and no matter how I feel, whether I feel saved or whether I don't, my fortune, my future is safe in the bosom of my Savior, Jesus Christ, who had everything to do with my salvation, and I am not a participant. I truly can trust him. We'll be back right after the message. You're listening to the Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. ahead of the dominant media, firstamendmentradio.com. 
and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month, and you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25, or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do Internet? Then call 559-781-3773 and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Since the beginning of time... Kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty, to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to support this program, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. Now, my dad lived 60-some-odd years of torment. Saved one day, going to hell the next. Every time he fell into sin... Every time he was beset by sin in his life, he began to doubt his own salvation. He lived a tortured life, as most free willers do, always trying to be good enough and always failing. And one time I saw peace come over the man's face. When a preacher came to him one time, a preacher that he didn't even like, explained to him the sovereign grace of God. My dad understood it. For the first time, I saw a real peace on the man's face. I have that peace. Yes, I still fall. I still disappoint myself, but Christ paid it all. None of my salvation is left unto me. And when I fall, I just thank for God's grace that he shed upon me when he offered his only begotten son a ransom. Paid it in full. He took a hopeless situation out of my hand and put it into his all-powerful hands. And I trust him. I have to trust him. Because I know no more than I could add one millimeter to my height. I can't add anything to my own salvation. And now... My service to Christ is only my reasonable service. And if I make a mistake here on Inquisition Update, and I make many, I listen to some of the recordings once in a while, I hear some of the mistakes I make, I just rely upon Christ and I pick up, correct my error, and keep on going. It's my reasonable service. 
to serve him the best way I can. And instead of letting Satan torment me, I just point to my Savior. Paid it all. He bore my sins on his body. Condemn him if you can. But you cannot condemn me. I've been put in a safe place. In him. You cannot touch me. I belong to him. Lock, stock, and barrel. See the peace? See the gratitude? See the humility? Do you see the protection of Christ? Arminius was trying to destroy the peace that was coming upon the Protestant world who began to understand the unlimited grace, the unconquerable grace of God. God's grace is without repentance. God is sovereign and all-powerful. All of a sudden, Europe was being freed of the tyranny and slavery, the spiritual slavery of the Roman Catholic Church, always trying to earn their way to heaven by going to confession, by participating in the sacraments, by worshiping Mary, images and idols, and, and doing penance and, and giving, indult, uh, giving gifts to the church and trying to buy their salvation, buying indulgences and one thing and another. And all of a sudden, the Protestant reformers came to understand Jesus did it all. Why do we remain servants to this godless system. And they came out of it. And Arminius tried to enslave them again. That's what happened. That's what we're reading about. Now, in order to deal with this heresy, these five points that we just read, in order to deal with these five articles of Arminianism, a conference was convened in 1618, which became known as the Synod of Dort. It was no convention of novices or weaklings that met at Dort in 1618. Reverend J. A. MacLeod, principal of the Free Church of, Scot of Scotland College, Edinburgh, described the Synod this way. Here's what he said, quote, They had among their leaders and counselors some of the foremost divines of their day, and the conclusions at which they arrived in the avowal of their faith and in the condemnation of error were not hastily come to. They were the ripe decisions of a generation of theologians who were at home in their subject, expert in wielding their weapons and temperate at rest and restrained in terms in which they set forth their judgment. Coming as they did in point of time after the national confessions and catechisms of the Reformed churches, except the documents of the Westminster Assembly, they, with these documents of British origin, are the culminating exhibition of our common Reformed faith when it was called upon to unfold its inmost genius and essence in self-defense against the revived semi-Pelagianism of the early Arminians, unquote. So the Arminians wanted to call a synod, call a synod into session to decide, do we participate in our own salvation or is it left entirely up to God to save us? And they got their synod and they also got confirmation that God alone saves without any help from man who is helpless. All right? These great theologians, these Protestant theologians of the day, sat for 154 sessions over a period of seven months. Okay? They didn't take this lightly. They took seven months pouring over the Scriptures. 
to see whether these things that the Arminians were saying were so. And they were assessing the teachings of Arminius in the light of Scripture and concluding they could find no biblical basis for his propositions. The Synod finally determined there was no reason to overturn the teachings of the Protestant Reformation. What was the teaching of the Protestant Reformation? Sovereignty for God. All sufficiency for God. Salvation by God and God alone. No works, lest any man should boast. No quality within a man. No spark of faith that he can use to cooperate with God to achieve this salvation. Totally depraved man is completely dependent upon an all-powerful God to save him. That is the Protestant teaching. Arminius tried to restore them to Roman Catholicism through his teaching that man plays a part in the salvation. Therefore, the Protestant Reformation is heresy. That's the ultimate goal of Satan through the Arminian heresy, to undo the Protestant Reformation. Are you beginning to comprehend where Arminius got his education? started out in the Protestant seminaries. It ended up in some Jesuit conclave someplace. You can bet your bippy on that one. All right. The Synod finally determined there was no reason to overturn the teaching of the Protestant Reformation. It reaffirmed the position that Arminius opposed. The Articles of Dort declared that God is entirely sovereign in salvation. Salvation is of the Lord, Jonah chapter 2, verse 9, and formulated five statements rebutting Arminian theology. In time, these statements became known as the five points of Calvinism. Quote, that Christ, which natural free will can apprehend, is but a natural Christ of a man's own making, not the Father's Christ nor Jesus, the Son of the living God, to whom none can come without Father's drawing. The John chapter 6, verse 19. Unquote. Synod of Dort held the basic teaching of the Word of God, the basic teaching of the foundations of Protestantism, that man, if he was to be allowed any part in his own salvation, would mess it up. We have to trust our pilot to get us there. We have to trust in his sacrifice. We have to trust in his redemption. We have to trust him completely. All right? Here's what it also says in the book of God's Word, Acts chapter 13, verse 48. Quote, And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. What came first? The believing? And then the eternal life? No, it says, As many as were ordained to eternal life Believed. That's what the Bible says. That's not what is taught in the churches. Whether they be Roman Catholic churches, or whether they be Baptist Roman Catholic churches, or Presbyterian Roman Catholic churches, or Lutheran Roman Catholic churches, if they believe in free will, they're a Roman Catholic church by whatever name they choose for themselves. As many as were ordained, and we have to know that this is by God, as many as were ordained by God to eternal life believed. 
Now, I was, uh, maybe I'm telling this story for the second time. You can suffer through it again. You suffer every day listening to me, don't you? Look, I was accused of being an Arminian. I didn't know what it meant. So I did my own research. What did this man accuse me of? Bitterly accusing me of being an Arminian. I don't even know what it is. So I did a little research on my own, superficial research as it was, but I researched it to find out if this man had a legitimate accusation against me. I found out a little bit about Arminianism. And in a subsequent conversation, he accused me once again of being an Arminian. I said, listen, you, let me tell you something. In my youth and inexperience and ineptitude in the Scripture, I once believed that I choose Christ, that I chose Christ. But now, in my maturity, after reading the Word of God, and by the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit, understanding the Word of God, I now understand it was God who chose me. It was God who chose me. I didn't choose God. I thought I did, but I'm fallible man, see? And what a blessing it is to discover that God chose me and caused me to believe, put the Word of God before me, gave me the ability to understand it. It's all Him. It was none of me. I had no part in it. It was He who caused me to will and to do his good pleasure. Wonderful teaching. Protestant teaching. Biblical teaching. Great from the portals of glory. Who can argue? Who would argue? Except a sinful, fallen, pride-sick, deceived human being. Swallow your pride. There's more rest in the truth than there is in free will. You understand that even though you call it free will, <laughs> it binds you with the heaviest chains? I will not be bound again. There's liberty in Christ. There's only bondage in free will. Because once you depend upon your free will, you have to depend upon your free will every day. And let me tell you something. You don't have complete control of your free will. You are bound to the fall of Adam. And your flesh will obey him. And when you have free will, you fight against what Christ tried to do for you. And no peace... Free will is Roman Catholicism. Free will is the teachings of the Antichrist in Rome who wishes to enslave you from cradle to grave. And that's what free will does. But when you trust Christ and Christ alone, when you just sit down, shut up, fasten your seatbelt, and hang on, you have liberty. You don't have to trust yourself anymore. You don't have to trust your sinful, fallen flesh anymore. You don't have to trust the temptations of Satan. You don't have to earn your salvation. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to confess your sins to a priest. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to work your fingers to the bone day and night to earn your salvation by your free will. What a, what a wonderful message the truth of the gospel gives us. We're, do you know what it's like to be truly free? No, we're not free to sin. That's not what I said. We just don't have to work for our salvation because there's not one thing we can do to help Jesus. Not one single thing. Again, you can see how the disciples tried to help Jesus and Jesus rebuked them. And he 
rejects all those who preach free will. Now, thus the teachings of Arminius and his cadre were unanimously rejected. That's everybody rejected. Everybody at the Synod of Dort rejected by the venerable, venerable divines assembled at the Synod, Synod of Dort. They were declared to be heresy. The positive response of the assembly was the reaffirmation of the doctrines of grace as taught at the Protestant Reformation. What did the Synod of Dort say? No, 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 Arminius. We will not allow you to bind us, nor all of Europe, once again, to be servants of Satan. We have tasted the liberty of Christ, and we will not go back to Rome. That's what was decided at the Synod of Dort. And we're not going to allow you, Arminius, to bind anyone else in Europe. We've been liberated from that sinful synagogue of Satan in Rome and all of its iron Roman chains. We've been liberated by Christ. We trust in Him. Fully and completely. And Him alone. They set the Arminians straight, but did they quiet down and change? No. They're dominant in the churches today. Every single one of them. And that's why there's no rest for the wicked. In order to refute the five points asserted by Arminius, the Synod of Dort issued four canons which were subsequently revised to five. These five canons have come down to us today as the five points of Calvinism and are often remembered by the, the acronym TULIP, T-U-L-I-P, an acronym that was devised to, to summarize the canons of Dort in response to the radical five-point scheme of the Arminian Remonstrance. Here they are. D, the total depravity of man. This refers to the total inability of man to change his fallen state. Quote, dead in trespasses and sins. Unquote. See Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 and 5, Colossians chapter 2 verse 13, and Psalms chapter, or Psalms 80 verse 18. Because man is utterly dead spiritually, he has not the capacity to do good or to exercise faith. Moreover, he does not have free will as it is, quote, in bondage under the, el under the elements of the world, unquote. See Galatians chapter 4, verse 3, and also Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25. Did you hear that? Man does not have free will as it his free will is, quote, in bondage under the elements of the world, unquote. So you're going to let your worldly elements place you in bondage? Or are you going to accept the free gift of God? can't have it both ways. Man does not have free will as it is, quote, in bondage under the elements of the world. The Bible says your free will is in bondage. You call it free will, but it is bondage. Under, ele under the elements of the world. Your free will that you call free is in bondage under the elements of the world. That's what it says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 3, and Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and 2 Timothy 2, 25. Did God contradict himself? No. There's no fault or error in him. 
There's no contradiction in him. There's no repentance in him. I have many of my listeners called, but I believe in free will. Okay. Suit yourself. But now you know what the Bible, the authorized King James Bible, says about free will. It is in bondage under the elements of the world. And isn't it surprising, or not surprising as the case may be, that free will leads you right back to the Roman Catholic Church? Bondage. Rejection of Christ. Servitude. Pray your way out of purgatory. Confess your sins to a priest. Look, it's either all or none with God. You're going to let God do it all, or are you going to do it all? Because you can't work together. You're made of different stuff. Contradictory stuff. Pull up the sleeve of your blouse or your shirt. Pinch yourself. Does it hurt? Is there real flesh and bone underneath your fingers when you pinch your flesh? That means you're still under you're still in the flesh, right? You've not been glorified. You're still in a sinful human flesh bound under the elements of the world. If you trust yourself and your own free will, you are bound under the elements of the world. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Protestant Reformers said. You call it free will. And you can freely exercise it, but it's bound under the elements of the world. And it serves the God of this world, too. What peace there is trusting Jesus alone. Have no part of the free will Arminian doctrine that was rejected at the Council of Dort because you put yourself back in bondage. We'll hit the other four elements of the uh, five points of Calvinism tomorrow. Stay tuned, we'll see more. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager, most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.